Yeah, the special relationship ha has a very significant impact in terms of the positions that the United States takes on the key legal issues involved in the conflict. Uh, and, and in general, I think one can say that our positions are out of step with the positions of most of the, uh, of the world community, uh, and that it's one of, of the major reasons for the, for the negative uh, perception of the United States uh, in, in the region that, that you've heard uh, about this morning. Um, uh, so I want to go through a number of, 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 of key legal issues. The first I'll mention, and on this one, I think that the administration uh, is not quite a, 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 as negative as, as you'll, uh, you'll find me saying on the others, uh, relates to the status of Jerusalem. Uh, the, um, the Congress uh, passed a law a couple of years ago to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, the president, uh, well, successive presidents now uh, have resisted uh, doing that. Uh, we have our uh, consulate general in Jerusalem, uh, which reports directly to the State Department. Uh, we, it has not been put under the, uh, the, the embassy in Tel Aviv. So, so as a, as a, as a, a technical matter, uh, the, the executive branch has pres preserved the position uh, that the status of Jerusalem is, is not uh, uh, determined. Uh, and and uh, we have not given in to the Israeli position on that. Uh, similarly, with respect to the question of passports, uh, Congress passed a law in 2002 saying uh, that a person born in, in Jerusalem who would become a U.S. citizen had the right, if uh, in uh, being issued a U.S. passport, to have Israel placed in the, the little box as to place of birth. Uh, the uh, administration has resisted that uh, and has refused to comply with that. Uh, this went to court. It was decided uh, quite recently here in the, the uh, Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit that it is within the power of the president to decide on issues of diplomatic recognition, and therefore it was within the power of the president uh, to refuse to, to apply that act. Okay, so, so that's the good news. Uh, that took about 35 seconds. Um, the, the question of, of territory is, is a bit... Uh, uh, bleaker. Uh, you heard this morning uh, uh, some references to the 1967 war. Um, uh, and, uh, and this is one on which the United States, uh, you know, should have been taking the, the view that President Eisenhower took in 1956 uh, when, when the war broke out in 1967, uh, but it didn't. Uh, and I think we're living with the consequences of that uh, to this day. The, um, uh, the, the background of the war, I think, was accurately uh, mentioned, if briefly, by General David this morning, uh, that it was an attack by Israel. Um, uh, it's commonly thought that Israel justified the attack uh, as uh, anticipatory self-defense, that is, that Egypt was going to attack. In fact, that's not what it said in the Security Council. Uh, what it said in the Security Council uh, was that Egypt had, in fact, attacked Israel on the morning of June 5th, and the Israeli military action was a response to that. That was the, the position of Abe Ibn all through the discussions uh, in the Security Council in June of 1967. Uh, it was, of course, a, a story that had been invented uh, because at a certain point, the Israeli uh, high command realized that the Egyptian army was overextended uh, in, in the troops that it had brought up to the border uh, and that they had a pretty good chance of destroying the Egyptian army if they attacked. Uh, and, and that's essentially what they did. Uh, and they were in discussion with the Johnson administration for about two weeks prior to June 5th, 1967. Uh, Abba Ibn made repeated uh, uh, communications and entreaties to the, uh, to the Johnson administration saying, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> we think that the Egyptians are going to attack. Uh, um, uh, and the Johnson administration kept responding by saying, no, it's not true. And the CIA w was, was analyzing on a daily basis and kept telling the, the administration, I think accurately, uh, that there was no indication that, that uh, Egypt was about to attack. Egypt was concerned that, that, that uh, Israel was threatening Syria and it wanted to deter an attack by Israel on Syria. Okay, um, uh, but um, uh, 
but that uh, uh, discussion uh, eventually just came to a kind of a standoff. But Johnson was fairly strong uh, in telling Israel not to attack uh, uh, Egypt. Uh, uh, finally, the Israelis gave up uh, on Abba Iben, and they sent Meyer Amit, the head of, of uh, Mossad, to come to Washington to put it to the administration a different way. He didn't say, please support us if we, if we uh, uh, attack. He said, you know, we're going to attack. What are you going to do? Uh, um, and the response he got uh, from a number of administration officials led him to believe that the U.S. government would keep quiet. That is, it wouldn't do a repeat of what Eisenhower did in 1956, uh, and that it, it would let Israel essentially get away with it if it were able to be done relatively quickly. Uh, Meyer Amit went back and had a meeting at Levi Eshkol's house on the night of the 3rd of June, 1967. Uh, and what he told Levi Eshkol uh, as to his impression of the Johnson administration and what it would do if Israel went ahead and attacked, he said, they will not sit Shiva, uh, meaning that they will not mourn, they will not be unhappy uh, if we do it. Um, uh, and he was right. When it happened, the administration immediately knew that the story that, that was, was being told by Abbe even was false, but they uh, uh, decided to, to keep quiet about it. Um, uh, uh, and I think we're living with that that uh, ever since. Uh, after about, uh, well, by early July, the Israeli government stopped saying that Egypt had attacked. Levi Eshkol gave a press conference uh, and was asked about the war, and that's when he said, uh, well, Egypt was going to attack us, and that's why we had to attack. So th they implicitly you know, acknowledged that the story had, had been false. Uh, but this story about their having been under threat uh, uh, it really took hold, and that, of course, is the dominant Israeli version now uh, of the war. Um, uh, and if you look at justifications that have, were given uh, in, in maybe a decade ago now uh, for the Bush Doctrine, when that was being discussed, the, the new policy about preemptive use of force for the United States, uh, those who tried to write theoretical justifications for that doctrine fished around to find precedents for it. And the only one they found was the 1967 war, which of course was a false precedent, but that was the only precedent they could find uh, in, in recent state practice for the proposition that it's okay to, uh, to invade uh, in, in substantial anticipation, let's say, uh, of, of an attack against an attack that is anticipated but is not uh, uh, close to being immediate. Uh, so on, on this issue, I think the, the administration is, uh, is quite deficient, and that, that holds true to the present. I mean, if you ask the administration now uh, uh, who was responsible for the 1967 war, you know, they're not going to, to, to give you a straight story on it. Um, the other major issue is the question of Palestine's status and, and whether Palestine is a state, the whole issue that's come up uh, before the General Assembly of the UN uh, and in the Security Council, in particular with the uh, application for admission to the UN that was filed in 2011 uh, by the government of, of Palestine. Uh, and of course, as you're aware, the, the, the United States kind of killed that in the Security Council uh, and kept it from uh, coming to uh, a vote. Uh, the, the Palestine government subsequently uh, applied for uh, admission to UNESCO, which is a UN specialized agency, uh, and membership is open only to a state. Uh, and, and there, there was, was no veto possibility, uh, and, and it passed. So uh, uh, Palestine was admitted as a, as a state uh, to uh, UNESCO, uh, and then uh, more recently went uh, in 2012 to the General Assembly of the UN uh, for a, a statement, essentially, uh, that, that, uh, that Palestine uh, is a state, uh, uh, and that, that passed. Uh, it passed, I think it was 139 votes in favor, and there, there are actually other states that, uh, that abstained on that resolution but have diplomatic relations with Palestine. Uh, if you add that number to the number that voted in favor of that resolution, you get somewhere around, I think it's 158 states uh, that, that have accepted Palestine uh, uh, as, as a state. 
Uh, and the United States resists that uh, and says, well, we, uh, Palestine can't be a state until it negotiates that with Israel, um, uh, which uh, you know, doesn't make a great deal of sense to me and, and isn't an accurate reflection of international practice about statehood. I mean, when you get 158 states saying that another entity is a state, you know, that, that's pretty, pretty strong. Um, uh, when this resolution was adopted in the General Assembly, and this is November of 2012, uh, Susan Rice spoke in, in explanation of vote for the United States. The United States voted, voted I didn't mention, voted against the resolution. Um, uh, and she said, today's voting should not be misconstrued by any as constituting eligibility for United Nations membership. It does not. The resolution does not establish that Palestine is a state. Well, the resolution says that Palestine is a state as a technical matter. She may be true that General Assembly resolutions uh, are, are, are not uh, legislative in, in character. But with respect to statehood, what, what's critical is an entity's acceptance by other uh, by the existing states of the world, and, and here, here you clearly have it. It goes back, in fact, to um, uh, to 1923, the Treaty of Lausanne, the, uh, the, the treaty that set up uh, Iraq and Palestine and Syria as states. If you look at that treaty, it refers to those three entities as being states detached from the Ottoman Empire. So the international community accepted those as, as states uh, going back uh, that far. The, um, the issue of settlements, uh, another one on which the United States position has, uh, has been very uh, uh, uncertain, let's say. Uh, you, you had analysis of this during the Carter administration, where the legal advisor came out very strongly, saying that the, the settlements are illegal under the Geneva Convention of, of 1949. Uh, uh, and then uh, you had President Reagan coming in and saying something, well, we're not sure about that, but they're an obstacle to peace. But, uh, but, uh, uh, but from that time, there wasn't much discussion uh, of the legality of settlements, uh, and when the bilateral process started in the mid-90s, the United States took the position in the Security Council that it would not support any Security Council resolutions critical of Israel, in particular uh, on settlements. So uh, as a result, it, it, it began vetoing resolutions that were critical of, uh, of Israel on settlement constructions, in particular around uh, Jerusalem. Uh, uh, but uh, more recently, uh, in, in, uh, when, when uh, Ms. Clinton was Secretary of State, uh, she began referring to new settlements as being uh, uh, illegal, uh, which implied that the, the prior settlements were, were, were okay. Now, we get a, a statement, this is now November of last year, from Secretary Kerry, who says settlements are illegitimate. Uh, they, they're, they've backed off the word illegal. I'm not sure what distinction they see between illegal and illegitimate. Um, uh, and, and he wasn't all that clear. He, was, he made the statement in a way that, that it might have applied to prior settlements, but, but still, it, it, it's very, uh, very uh, uh, ambiguous. Uh, and this is, of course, against the very strong opinion of, 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 the, uh, of the world community on the question uh, of, of settlements. Uh, the United States has also uh, pressured the Palestine government uh, not to go to the International Criminal Court, uh, which would be a way of dealing with the settlements. And to my mind, the only way within legal principle that the settlements can presently be dealt with since uh, uh, negotiation and pressure from the United States doesn't seem to be very uh, effective. But the International Criminal Court statute defines war crimes. One of the war crimes, a long list of things defined as war crimes, one of them is transferring civilians into territory under belligerent occupation. So it's a slam dunk uh, uh, with respect to the settlements in, in the West Bank. Um, uh, and, and that, I think, uh, actually should be pursued by the International Criminal Court, uh, uh, even without any further action on the, on the part of the government of Palestine, but on the basis of the conferment of jurisdiction that Palestine did to uh, in uh, 2009 after the Gaza War, when it 
filed a statement with the International Criminal Court uh, saying that it conferred jurisdiction for any uh, war crimes uh, or genocide, whether, uh, crimes against humanity uh, committed in the territory of, of, uh, of, of Palestine. Um, uh, and and the, the prosecutor uh, uh, should be able to work simply on that basis uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and go ahead and investigate. And fortunately, the prosecutor uh, first said, well, I'm not sure whether Palestine is a state. Um, um, so I, I, I was a bit mystified by that. So I sent him an email uh, in, in March of 2009. I said, well, you know, by the way, Palestine is a state, and, and you have every basis for this. And, uh, and eventually, other people started sending him memos in the other direction. Uh, so eventually he invited all of us to come to The Hague and argue it out. And we, we went and Dory Gold came and argued against uh, uh, jurisdiction. Um, and eventually, unfortunately, the prosecutor's office decided that it was not its position to make a determination as to whether Palestine was a state. This is after three years of saying it was struggling with the issue. It decided that, that it was not its position. And that, in fact, is what led the Palestine government to go to the General Assembly and get the resolution that adopted in November uh, of, of uh, 2012. Um, uh, but uh, there's also the question, question of repatriation of the refugees uh, from, from uh, uh, 1948. I'll just finish with, with that. Uh, here, the United States position used to be very strong. If you look at the proceedings of the UN General Assembly in December of, of 1948, when, uh, when the resolution was being adopted calling on Israel to repatriate, uh, Dean Rusk was representing the United States, and he stood up and made a speech. And he said that the refugees should not be pawns of a political settlement. The position of Ben-Gurion at the time was, we will deal with the refugee issue when and if we get recognition from the Arab states. And Dean Rusk was saying, no, this is a humanitarian issue. It needs to be dealt with. Uh, and the United States voted in favor of General Assembly Resolution 194 that was adopted then. Uh, and every year thereafter, when it was re reiterated, by the General Assembly up until the mid-90s. The United States voted in favor of those reiterations of General Assembly Resolution 194, and then, then, uh, then uh, uh, we stopped. Uh, and, and now, of course, Israel has a peace agreement with Egypt. It has a peace agreement with Jordan, and it's a negotiating agreement with Israel. So Ben-Gurion's rationale, uh, if, if that was the real rationale, would mean that Israel should be prepared to accept all the refugees back. Uh, but, but this is not being pressed by the United States in, in the negotiations, not at all. At Camp David in the year 2000, President Clinton really didn't take the repatriation question very seriously. Uh, uh, Mr. Kerry apparently has suggested that maybe 80,000 should be taken back. That, that's a rumor, uh, uh, but, but clearly we're not taking a strong position. Thank you.